I've called the title Pragmatic Text Mining from Literature to Electronic Health Records, and I think pragmatic is really the key attitude here that I have to the topic. Because when you're working in biomedicine, not among the people who are mainly interested in the computer science parts of things, but interested in actually understanding biology or medicine, one of the questions you get immediately if you mention text mining is why on earth would you want to work on such a thing? And the point is, I tend to agree with them. I, I don't really care much for text mining. It's not much of an interest of mine. What I care about is data mining. I want to do data mining, analyzing all the information we have on a number of different topics, and trying to tie things together using sort of general guilt by association principles. So trying to look at things and say, how can I link A to B based on whatever kind of evidence I can get my hands on? And just to illustrate that I mean it very broadly when I, when I say whatever kind of evidence I can get my hands on, this is my favorite guilt by association network. As you might be able to see, the names in this, it's names of people, not names of proteins or genes or diseases, but names of people. And the edges in this network, the lines, that's based on emails. This is an email network. You link people to other people based on who's sending emails to whom. And what's funny about this particular network is that it's not some random email network. It's actually an email network of who was sending emails to whom during the last week before the whole company Enron went bankrupt. So what you have here is people inside and outside the company sending emails right before the company went, went bust. And you have some unnamed people down here. They were outside the company sending a lot of emails with people inside. Some of them sold their shares in time and were later convicted of insider trading. And you also see the whole board of directors over here sending no emails while the whole company was crashing around them. They were playing golf. And this is, this is nice data. This is the kind of data I like to work on because this is structured data. You know, you can immediately read out of an email header who is the email from, who is the email to. You don't have to do text mining. Unfortunately, most of the data that I get in the field of biomedicine, unfortunately, comes in the form of unstructured text. And that is the only reason why I do text mining. That's because, unfortunately, most of the data I want to do data mining on comes in the most inconvenient format you could possibly imagine, which is human readable text. So what, what, what kind of text am I doing text mining on? Well, of course, like everybody else, I'm working on the biomedical literature, which looks something like this. It's a very tall pile. Everybody talks about how it's growing exponentially, yada, yada, yada. This is just a quick back of the envelope estimate. If you take Medline, which is 20-some million abstracts, assume behind each of them you have a five-page paper, you print it out on standard 80-gram A4 paper, you stack it on top of each other, you get a pile well over 10 kilometers. Of course, in reality, a paper is probably on average more than five pages long and so on, and there's a lot of papers that are not indexed by Medline. It doesn't really matter. The pile is probably also more than 20 kilometers, but 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers, the reality is there's just too much for us to read. I can't read it, you can't read it, nobody can read it, and that's why we need to get a computer to read it. Now, when I need to get a computer to do something like this, reading text, I find it useful to think about this analogy that a computer is about as smart as a dog. And by that I mean that if I put sufficient effort into it, I can train it to do specific tricks. And borrowing a cartoon, what we say to dogs, okay, Ginger, I've had it. You stay out of the garbage, understand, Ginger? Stay out of the garbage or else. And of course, the only thing the dog understands is its own name, Ginger. And all the words in between is just blah, blah, blah. Now, I'm slightly more ambitious on behalf of my computer than this. I, I don't want it to just recognize its own name, but I generally want the computer to recognize names of stuff I'm interested in, and I fully accept that most of the text in between those names is going to be blah, blah, blah to the computer. And of course, this thing of recognizing names in text is uh, what people in text mining like to use complicated, they, they love complicated terms for simple things. So they call it named entity recognition, which of course means nothing but recognizing stuff with names. And when you want to do this on text, you obviously need two things. One thing you need is a text corpus, a body of text, the text we're gonna do text mining on. And the other thing you need is a comprehensive lexicon that tells you all the different names of what you want to find. So you need to know which names are synonyms, because we use synonyms a lot, we have lots of different gene names for the same gene and so on. 
We need to, compl uh, to complement that with some expansion rules that allow us to generate other variants of the names we know to be able to still find them in text. So that would be, for example, dealing with various forms of prefixes and suffixes and names. For example, if you have a human gene name, then the equivalent gene in mouse is often called the same thing. And then if you have a paper in which they're studying both human and mouse, it gets really confusing. And then to help the reader, they decide to put an H in front of all the human gene names and an M in front of all the mouse gene names. And of course, if you don't know that you're allowed to put an H in front of every human gene name and it still means the same, then your text mining is going to perform very badly. On top of this, you also need to deal with some sort of flexible matching that's to generate even more variants of so dealing with things like just hyphens and spaces. Do you write something in one word? Do you write it in two words? Or do you write it in two words with a hyphen? It probably still means the same thing. Last but certainly not least, if you want to do a good job doing name density recognition, you need a blacklist. And a blacklist, that's a list of all the names that are in your dictionary and which you would find in the text because they're in your dictionary and they're in your dictionary for all the right reasons. They are perfectly correct names. They might even be the recommended gene symbols for certain genes. But when you go through text, when you find these names, then 99% of the time they mean something completely different. My favorite example is if you're so unlucky to work with Drosophila. They actually have a gene called A. I'm joking, they don't have a gene called A. They have two genes called A. They have one called lowercase a and a different unrelated gene called uppercase a. And you can imagine if you have a dictionary with the name A in it and you do text mining on English text, just exactly how big of a success that's gonna be. So you need to block these so that you don't make enormous amounts of errors due to a few very unfortunate names. Now, this is sort of the general approach. This is what everybody does. And then from here on, things divide out a little bit into two different approaches among the people doing text mining, I would say. There's what I call the formal way, which is where you really try to do things the right way, the way people have been doing it, the way where you have, you know, sort of competitions on who's best at doing X and so on. And the next thing you would do is then to benchmark your method and say, how good is it? So to do that, you would of course take a manually annotated corpus where some people have gone through the text and marked up what is supposed to be tagged here. Then you would run whatever tool you've generated, dictionary based through it, and automatically tag names in it. And then you can compare the two to each other. And then you would do the counting exercise. You would count the true positives, which is the things that they agree on. You would count the false positives, which are the things that were tagged by the computer, but according to the human being shouldn't be the ones that were tagged by the human being, but which the computer failed to tag. And well, this, the true negatives that you often talk about also in machine learning, doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's very difficult to define in text mining because the true negatives would be the things that the computer didn't tag and which indeed, according to the human, shouldn't be tagged. But since matches can have variable length and so on, it's very difficult to define how many of those there actually are. Of course, based on these three numbers, you can then calculate various quality metrics, things like the precision, how much of what you tag is correct, things like recall, how much of the stuff that you should tag did you manage to tag, and um, then you can combine that if you want a single number, F-score, and then you can rank your methods, and then you can say, congratulations, you are 2% better than what people managed to do five years ago, which I personally find one of the most boring things you can do in this world. Now, there's a couple of issues with doing this. The, the biggest issue, of course, is that to actually do this kind of benchmarking, you need a manually annotated corpus. And when you need a manually annotated corpus, as the previous speaker alluded to, you have two options. Either you use an existing corpus, and if such a corpus exists, then almost by definition, whatever you're doing is not new, because there's, there's very little chance that somebody else bothered to make a manually annotated corpus of X unless they did it because they wanted to benchmark a method for doing X, in which case your method for doing X is not the first. The alternative is that what you're doing is you are actually the first to do it, in which case your only option is to make a new corpus. And generally making a new corpus is hard work, and I'm allergic to that. So, yeah. 
I don't really like taking this approach if I can avoid it. Then following this, people will typically start working more on the sort of natural language processing, working on actually parsing the sentence structures, or doing part of speech tagging, labeling what is verbs, what is nouns, all that. Semantic tagging of various words of interest, I do some of this sometimes. And then syntactic parsing of the sentences, and that way you can parse a simple little sentence like the expression of the cytochrome genes SIG1 and SIG7 is controlled by HUB1. And you would recognize these three as being gene names, and you would recognize words like expression and genes and controlled. And based on that, you would be able to actually pull out relationships so that you know that HUB1 controls the expression of SIG1, and HUB1 controls the expression of SIG7, and you could put that as triples in your triple stores or whatever you want to do. The other way, which is what I normally do, is the pragmatic approach. And, of course, you still have to do some sort of benchmarking, but I like to refer to what I do as benchmarking light, which is very much like benchmarking, but requires fewer calories. Um, the trick is what I start from is a non-annotated corpus. So I just take a lot of relevant text without human beings going through it and marking up anything. And then I run my method through it and I tag things. And then I randomly sample some of the stuff that got tagged and inspect it. And then, of course, I can get two out of the three numbers very easily. Without going through a ton of text marking it up manually, I just randomly pick, say, one or two hundred matches that come out of my tagger, and I count how many of them are right and how many of them are wrong, and then I know my precision. Of course, I can't know how much I failed to find, so I can't estimate the recall. But, you know, I don't really care too much, because if I got one million things out of the text, and I know that 80% of them are right, then I have one million hits, 80% of which are right, and it's not terribly relevant whether there's one or two million other things I didn't get, I still have a million. So I, I don't care that much about it, really. And also, you can actually calculate the relative recall of two different methods. Because if you know the precision and you know how much they found, then you know that the method that found more with the same precision will have better recall. You don't know the absolute recall, but you are able to say that A has twice as good recall as B, which is fully sufficient for my purposes. So you can compare methods, you can say which method is better than another method, and you can even explicitly state which one has better precision, which one has better recall. You just, ca just can't say what is the recall. Then the next thing I do is I don't bother parsing the sentences. I just do simple co-mentioning. The logic being, if people mention two things together, there's a pretty good chance they have something to do with each other because people generally don't run around mentioning stuff together just for the fun of it. And, of course, if you want to do this kind of counting of co-mentionings in the text, you have to think about at which level in the text, which resolution should you do the counting. Should you count within documents? Especially if you go to full text articles, you could imagine things in the beginning of the end of the article might have nothing to do with each other. Should you require that it's within the same paragraph, within the same sentence? And it's clear, of course, the smaller units of text you take, the more precise it's going to be. But it's also clear you're going to lose out of things, because you are going to have things where two things were mentioned together in the same paragraph, but not the same sentence, but they are related. So you have to somehow combine this, and that's what we do. We count at all three levels, and then we combine this into a single weighted score that takes into account the number of documents they were mentioned in together, the number of, of the documents in which they were mentioned in the same paragraph, the number of documents in which they were mentioned in the same sentence, and then also normalize that for this co-mentioning of A and B. How much was A mentioned in general? How much was B mentioned in general? Because, of course, if you have P53 mentioned together with something else, you have better have a lot of co-mentionings before you believe that has anything to do with anything. Then the next thing I do is I get these weighted scored associations. So now I can make a ranked list of associations, ranked based on how much I believe in them. And then I compare that to a gold standard, not of going through text, but a gold standard of, of things like pathway databases or things like that, where we have genes where we know that these genes function together, and we have cases where we know what these, these genes do, but they don't really seem to function together on the same pathway. And then I can do simple counting on that and say, how good are my associations? So I do my text mining, I do the tagging, I don't benchmark that part properly, then I do my co-occurrence scoring, then I benchmark that on a gold standard of interactions, and then I say, well, you know, if the associations that come out of it, if they're good quality and there's a lot of them, then I guess the tagging was good enough. 
Because at the end of the day, what I cared about was not, tack was not tacking things in text. What I cared about was pulling out associations. And the reason why that is sort of the approach I'm taking is really that what I want to do is unify text with data. So I'm involved in generating a ton of different tools where we're using text mining as just one small component of a bigger system. We're combining text mining with what is available in terms of cu manually curated knowledge and databases like Uniprot, for example. Experimental data where people deposit more or less raw, high-throughput experiments into various repositories. Computational prediction methods where you might take protein sequences and look at them and say, given the sequence, I think so and so about this protein. And the problem of doing this, there's a lot of hard work in it. Um, there are many different sources where we get any given kind of data from. They're, they use different identifiers, so once again you get back to the synonyms lists, not just for names, but also for database identifiers where you need to know that this in this database and that in that database is actually one and the same. The data are varying quality, which is sort of my politically correct way of saying that some of it is complete crap. And yeah, what we do to deal with this is we map everything onto common identifiers. So we've, I, we've decided up front, here's the human genome, here are the genes that we believe are in it. This is what we're going to call this gene. And whatever it's called in some other database, we're going to map it onto our frame of reference. And then we compare, once again, everything to a gold standard so that we score everything. It doesn't matter if it's sex mining. It's text mining, it might be co-expression in microarrays, it might be manually curated uh, things, high throughput, these two hybrid screens, what have you. We do all these different types of data, we benchmark all of it against the same gold standard, and that way we're able to actually say this and that is equally reliable, even though it is completely different types of data that are not even similar in nature. Then what we do is we make all of it available as publicly available web resources, and just to brag about a few of them. We do a lot of work on protein networks or gene networks, the string database, many, many people use that, to link genes to each other that might be functioning together. We have an extended version of that, which has chemical networks, so there you also get nodes that are small molecule compounds, or so metabolites and drugs and so on being linked to their protein targets or enzymes metabolizing them and so on. We have a subcellular localization resource where, once again, we take all these different types of evidence, text mining being just one, and map it onto a cell so you can go in with your favorite protein and say, this protein I'm working on now, where do we have evidence for it being? And of course, we care a lot about provenance of the data. You can go in and click on it and say, OK, this protein, we think it's in the mitochondria. Why do you think that? And you can dig into the data and you can go back, you know, come from the helicopter view back into digging and say, well, it came from co-mentioning in abstracts and they're like, okay, show me the abstract, right? Show me the words in the abstract that you believed meant mitochondria and that you believed meant this gene. Same thing for tissue expression, where is it in the human body? Disease associations, which diseases are, have which genes involved in them, all that. And speaking of diseases, so far I've talked about the work we do and sort of the biomedical data, the public databases, Medline abstracts, also full text articles, by the way, especially the open access part. But a completely different type of, of data and text we're dealing with is electronic health records. We've heard a little bit about mining electronic health records already, and I'm sort of lucky in that context that I'm in Denmark because the Scandinavian countries in general, Denmark in particular, we have sort of a different system from what you see in most countries. So we have a lot of data available for doing research on. Whenever you go into hospital, this is true in most countries, when you walk in through the door, they capture various administrative information related to you. Um, how old are you, your gender, probably some sort of unique ID that uniquely identifies you as being you. And then various data gets added to that while you're at hospital. There might be radiology images, there might be results from blood tests done in the lab, whatever other tests they might do on you. And of course you have the clinical narrative, which is all the text written about you by the doctors and nurses. And if you look at this, it's a big multidimensional matrix and you can slice and dice this in many, many different ways. Typically what they care most about at the hospital, of course, point of care, is that you look up a single patient and you want to see what do we actually know about this person for the sake of thinking how are we going to treat this person, what has been done already. Some places they do statistics just to sort of keep track on how things are going and whether there are general drifts in certain blood values of people at the hospital and the instruments and so on. 
But what we want to do is more research where you're trying to correlate things with each other and link things up. If you look at this data, once again, there are two different types of data. The structured data, which is the data that is nice and easy to work with, would be things like the assigned diagnosis, the medication information, lab values, demographics. That's easy. And then there's the unstructured data, which is the clinical narrative. And that looks something like this. So this is, a, this is a Frankenstein record, so this is a combination of several different patients, just a little snippet of text from here and there. He's obviously showing you this amount of text from an actual individual patient, there's no way I could do for privacy reasons. Um, you notice that there's a, a, proper, a couple of issues here, aside from it being, being just text. One is, of course, it's text in Danish. And that means you can't really use any of the standard tools that are out there. You have to generate dictionaries and everything for being able to work with this in Danish because it's in Danish. Then there's the issue that it's made by busy doctors using lots of acronyms, making lots of typos. And yeah, we need to do text mining on it because it's really a lot of text. Of course, it's not as big as, the, uh, as all of Medline or the full biomedical literature. But still, it's quite substantial. So some of the data we're working on is data from a psychiatric hospital. And some of these interviews with uh, psychiatrists and patients, is, I mean, th there are some records that are actually about the same length as uh, Lord of the Rings, the trilogy. And you don't want to sit and read through it. So we need, once again, comprehensive dictionary, in our case, because of what we want to work on. We want adverse drug reactions and we want drugs. So we want to be able to recognize the kinds of side effects the patients get when they get certain drugs. And to recognize that, of course, we need to not just have all the names, we, we need to know there's a drug called this, but like I said before, we need to deal with typos. So it's very interesting, particularly with drug names, because the companies are very inventive when it comes to, figure, to, to coming up with names of drugs, which means that the doctors don't really have any idea how it's spelled. They know what it's called, so you sort of get into the discipline of phonetic spelling, because these are all the actual different ways at this one small hospital that we've seen this one drug spelled. Um, oh, is that with a K, or is it CL, or CHL, or was it an S, or O? And, and you, you can imagine there's lots of permutations, and these things, is it an F, or is it two Fs, or is it PH, or yeah. Um, it's not that difficult to guess how people are going to misspell names, and that's basically what we're doing. We're guessing, and we're also doing sort of edit distance searches to find drug names and then find very similar things that like, sound like plausible ways that doctors might have misspelled this. Then the next thing we do is simply temporal correlations. We take all this information about which patients were on which drugs, which dosage, when, and then we combine that with text mining, all the text about those patients, where, of course, these different notes written by the doctors and nurses, they have timestamps on them. So we know when they were written relative to when the patients were on certain drugs. And then we combine that with a bunch of handcrafted rules that I'll just try to very quickly give you, give you an idea about how it works. So we have the time of drug introduction, that comes out of structured data and drug discontinuation. So that's the period of time when this patient is on this drug. And we're just looking at one patient now. And then we have all the notes in between, and at some point in time, we identify something that could be an adverse event, possibly due to this drug, possibly due to something completely different. The first point when we start looking is the day after people start on the drug. There's two reasons for this. One is that there are fairly few side effects, in particular side effects that are not incredibly well known, that happen immediately. Usually you start taking a drug and it takes a little bit of time before you build up the dosage where you actually get side effects. The other thing is if you look in the clinical notes on the day when the patient starts getting the drug, you will have all kinds of adverse drug, uh, drug reactions mentioned. And the reason for that is that you have all this information about the doctor having informed the patient about the adverse drug reactions they might get which is not the adverse drug reactions they actually got. So for that reason, we skip the first day. Then we start filtering out things with a lot of rules. We have, of course, looking for negations, or what we call negative modifiers in the text. So negations, obviously, if it says that the patient did not get headache, then you shouldn't interpret that as the, as the patient getting a headache. But also, we need to filter out things like if the sentence mentioned words like mother, father, brother, sister, and you're talking about uh, hereditary diseases, 
then quite likely whatever is written in this sentence actually doesn't have anything to do with the patient, but has things to do with the relatives of the patient. So you, you really want to avoid those sentences. We also filter out everything that involves indications of the drug. The problem is there's a huge overlap between adverse drug reactions and diseases. So something that can be a disease can also be a disease that is actually caused by getting a drug. So there's a huge overlap there. And of course, you don't want to claim, you want, don't want to go out and say that aspirin causes headache because you see it mentioned a lot together with headache, right? Um, so you obviously want to filter out that whatever is the reason why you're giving the drug is not the adverse drug reaction of the drug. Then on top of that, we filter out what is known adverse drug reactions of other drugs. Because lots of these patients, in particular at a psychiatric hospital, are on five, six, seven different drugs at the same time. And for that reason, of course, you wouldn't want to claim, oh, I think this is a novel adverse drug reaction of so-and-so drug, when the, all the patients who experienced that adverse drug reaction were also on some other drugs that are well known to cause that. So you have to skip that. Pre-existing conditions, that means we look before the time of drug introduction for the same patient and say, if the same kind of thing was ever mentioned for this patient before they even started getting this drug, maybe this is just some problem this patient has and it has absolutely nothing to do with the drug. And then we're left with a tiny little bit of stuff where this is an adverse event, a possible adverse drug reaction of this drug that happened for a patient while they were on the drug. It didn't happen before they started getting the drug. It's not something that is known for some of the other drugs this patient is on, etc., etc. And then we divide those out simply into adverse drug reactions that are the ones we know. So we do actually, again, text mining on the... Uh, so the the information sheets for the doctors because they have these information sheet about all the FDA approved drugs that have a section about adverse drug reactions informing the doctor about what is known about this drug in terms of adverse drug reactions. So of course there are some that we refined and then there are the ones where it's not listed so this is possibly new. And indeed we are able to of course refine known adverse drug reactions, estimate frequencies of them, all those kinds of things. But more interesting, we are able to discover actual adverse drug reactions. And that's just based on text mining something like 6,000 patients at a small hospital. We are able to find things that are not found in clinical trials, and which look very plausible. Um, we find things where it's not known for this drug, but it's known for other drugs of the same class. So same mechanism of action. Um, so we are able to find things, and I think this really shows this is a proof of concept that what can, with what can be done by mining the medical data on even, from even just one small hospital. Imagine what we could do if we combined all the data from all the hospitals in Denmark, not to mention, of course, all hospitals in Europe, which would uh, add further challenges in terms of cross-lingual sex mining. So with that, I just want to acknowledge a lot of people who did the work. So the work on molecular networks, the string and stitch databases, has very much started in Pierre Borg's group at the EMBL in Heidelberg. Christian von Meering has been absolutely instrumental to it. Michael Kuhn as well, a number of PhD students and postdocs over the years. The localization and disease text mining and databases, Sune Frankil was key to developing the text mining work that was behind a lot of this. Many other people contributed on various parts of this work. Also worked together, and especially on the visualization with Sean O'Donoghue's group in Sydney, Australia. So they did all these beautiful cell images and uh, schematics of the human body and so on. And the medical text mining, the adverse drug reaction work was really done by one excellent PhD student who's finished recently called Robert Eriksson. And it was done in collaboration with Thomas Vau's group at the psychiatric hospital and Søren Brunak's group, he was in fact, Søren was the supervisor of Robert Eriksson, and back in the day, he was also my PhD supervisor. So, thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>